Hello, everybody. I'm Shane Smith, Director of Programming for Hot Docs, and thank you for joining us for this special and incredibly timely live conversation for the film Coded Bias, part of our Big Ideas program sponsored by Scotia Wealth Management. I'd like to thank our co-presenters, the Democracy Exchange Conference and the U.S. Consulate General of Toronto for their support. We would like to acknowledge the diversity of the First Peoples of the territory on which the festival takes place and honor the stewardship of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. We're grateful to have the opportunity to live on this territory. The format for this event is a hosted conversation with audience questions. You can ask questions by entering them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being closed captioned by AI Media. If you need closed captioning, you can turn it on in your Zoom app. Now, I'd like to introduce the host for this event, Mirasha Watamaniuk, Senior International Programmer for Hot Docs, who will introduce our outstanding guests. Take it away, Mirasha. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at home from your screens for what is perhaps one of the most timely discussions that we're going to be having at Hot Docs 2020. And that's all around uh, Shalini Catania's fantastic documentary, Coded Bias, which I hope you've already enjoyed. Uh, and we're so pleased to be talking about the intersection of science, bias, racism, and the way science and all of those elements influence our lives today with not only the filmmaker of Coded Bias, Shalini Catania, but also the lead data journalist and associate professor from the Carter Journalism Institute at NYU, Meredith Broussard. Thank you so much for joining both of us. to uh, refresh everyone's memory uh, by showing a little taste of the seminal ideas that we're going to be discussing uh, in today's discussion. So if we can roll our first clip, that'd be amazing. During my first semester at MIT, I got computer vision software that was supposed to track my face. It didn't work until I put on this white mask. I'm thinking, all right, what's going on here? Is it the lighting conditions? Is it the angle at which I'm looking at the camera? Or is there something more? That's when I started looking into issues of bias that can creep into technology. Our ideas about technology that we think are normal are actually ideas that come from a very small and homogeneous group of people. Vast amounts of data at incredible speeds. Everybody has unconscious biases, and people embed their own biases into technology. This kid got stopped as a result of facial recognition misidentification. And then used that as justification to search you. This is an innocent child. Racism is becoming mechanized. Systemic issues are only going to be hardwired into new technologies. It's not just face classification, it's any data-centric technology. Every day, we are all being scored. Who gets hired? Who gets housing? I am making predictions for your life right now. The people who own the code deploy it on other people, and there is no accountability. Management at Atlantic Towers wanted to install the facial recognition software. Pretty much turned this place into Fort Knox. The technology is being rapidly adopted, and there are no safeguards. We are socially controlled in a way that we don't see. technology that analyzes faces could be biased, but the company is pushing it anyway. What demographic is it most effective on? White men. Show me that it's going to be fair, that it's legal, before you put it out. That's what we don't have yet. It's going to take people coming together, striving for justice in this age of automation. So that is where we are going to kick off our discussion today, uh, and protests are happening as we speak. Facial recognition is being used right in this live moment uh, at protests across the nation, across the world. I'm wondering, Shalini and Meredith, if you can talk to us a little bit about the fact that uh, we have unprecedented times and this technology surely must be surveilling us 
during these protests. And if you wanna comment on that. Yeah, first I wanna thank Hot Docs so much for, for hosting this really important conversation. And I wanna acknowledge Joy Blomamwini who couldn't be with us tonight, but without whose groundbreaking research we would not be having this conversation. Um, this is such an incredible moment to be talking about this. Just moments before uh, I was setting up for this event and the protesters were literally outside my window and to see people of um, all colors marching peacefully together towards uh, a more equitable world. And it's never been a more important time that we talk about how we cannot afford to embed the injustices of the past in the technologies of the future. And I think that's really important. And we're seeing now um, really invasive surveillance being used not just by police, but by the FBI, by ICE, um, to the full extent we are not even able to see because we don't yet have laws that govern this conduct in the United States. So, uh, 117 million Americans are already in a facial recognition database. And that has happened without a single person in an elected office giving the word. Essentially, police departments picking up a new tool and experimenting with people's rights. And we've seen it uh, with the Freddie Gray protests. And you can imagine how dangerous this is um, on our freedom, our freedom to assemble, our freedom to protest, our freedom of association. Um, facial recognition is a technology that intersects with so many of our rights and freedoms. And um, it's so important that we have laws that govern its use. And Meredith, if you can comment right now, uh, as we said, the protests are increasing every day. Uh, and surely the surveillance systems from variety of police departments are likewise increasing. What do you know about that? Well, thank you for, uh, for the opportunity to participate in this very timely discussion. Uh, I think that the conversation about surveillance is very important right now because it is a conversation about racial justice. Uh, the racial injustice that is being embedded in technologies uh, is giving it the force of law. You probably heard the expression code is law. And so when we have bias that exists in the world, it gets embedded in algorithms as algorithms are increasingly being used to make decisions on our behalf uh, whether it's decisions about credit, whether it's decisions about who uh, gets put in jail, whether it's decisions about who gets a mortgage and has the opportunity to build intergenerational wealth. These are decisions with a lot of historical weight behind them. And if we simply reproduce the world as it is right now, we're not getting to the world as it should be. And we need to have this conversation right now because all kinds of surveillance are being deployed on citizens as a matter of course, and people don't know enough about it. So this is especially acute as we're thinking about what kinds of surveillance are being deployed on protesters right now. I think that we should also delineate the protests that are being uh, surveilled because two weeks ago there were mass protests everywhere against public health regulations and we certainly saw news coverage of some police and some surely surveillance that accompanied them to surveil the protesters but we are seeing a very different style some would argue much more aggressive certainly larger in numbers of attention from uh, police and potentially military against protests regarding racism the surveillance has to be even greater? Is that is that a, a logical conclusion that we can, a rational conclusion that we can come to? It is a logical conclusion. We know that law enforcement are, are picking up these tools and using it. We don't have any laws that actually give us rights to that information. And so in the UK, um, 
an or a great organization called Big Brother Watch UK uh, actually was able to do a study because the laws are different in Europe. And what they found is that 90, over 90% 90 of the people that were being stopped were misidentified. Over 2,000 people were wrongly identified by facial recognition. And of course, because of Joy's groundbreaking work, we know that this technology is not accurate on people of color. And we know that it's being used disparately on those communities of color. So the this is a very dangerous situation. Um, we saw in my film, a 14 year old boy get stopped in school uniform by facial recognition. And this um, without legislation has the danger of being the new stop and frisk. I wanna just pause there at that moment because I think that is one of the most disturbing from the variety of disturbing images that Coded By shows us, it was the impunity with which those uh, security forces stopped that 14 year old. And despite uh, his reactions and those of onlookers and the fellow children who were with him, it's that impunity. And you've just said, Shalini, that the laws in Europe are different. And yet that impunity is what seems to be the constant and what I would argue is uh, this other bias that no one talks about and that is that they, the impunity of enforcement. That's absolutely right. And, and what's happening is that those systems of oppression have just become more opaque. And so this young kid, this child who's been wrongly stopped by five plainclothes police officers and frisked has to doesn't even know why he's been stopped and they're saying no it's the computer says it's a match right and so it becomes this um it's impunity you have it's not transparent it's not opaque it's not democratic it's not accurate and it's discriminatory so it's a real danger for democracies and, and again, this is happening in a country that has laws that are different from those of North America. So as much as we're all watching what's happening on television and kind of reveling in a marker of time, life before COVID, life before uh, these George Floyd protests, what I imagine to be life before for that 14 year old boy is entirely different now afterwards. And I feel as a world, as a culture, uh, as humanity, we're experiencing that post moment together. That said, um, you know, we've got some great questions already coming from our audience. And I just want to throw one in right away. Tekia Hendrickson is asking about what about uh, the conversation about COVID and contact tracing and how AI can be beneficial in those terms. Uh, but is this not still the same praxis of issues uh, that we're discussing? Issues. It's one of the reasons I'm so excited to have this conversation because we're living in an age where we, we're just used to seeing big tech as this white knight hero that sort of sweeps in when it's been built by this very elite group of people. And so now Google and Apple are coming together and say, no, we just need to know your location and who you've been with. And, and, and we'll do all the hard work, not thinking that the communities that have been most impacted by COVID are communities of color and elderly communities, and they may not even have this high tech. And so I am wary that in this moment and in this moment of crisis that we'll rush in for these authoritarian technologies that have really very harmful Conse unintended consequences for the future of our democracies. Uh, and I think it's- Yeah, that I, uh, that I talk about in my book called techno chauvinism. It's the idea that technology is superior uh, to other solutions. And I think we can see techno chauvinism at work in this fantasy that contact tracing apps are going to save us. People have put a lot of faith in the idea that, oh, Apple and Google are going to build contact tracing apps and everybody's going to download the app and it's going to somehow magically work and it's going to alert us uh, when we have been on somebody who's infected. Now, this is entirely a fantasy. I would start by saying 
that the people who are making contact tracing apps are at home under the same conditions that we're all suffering under. They don't have enough childcare. Uh, they are worried about uh, the anti-blackness that is rampant in the world nowadays. They're worried about COVID. These are not conditions under which anybody does their best work, okay? So it's technology that's being rushed to market. And then we can also reflect on the fantasy that there's going to be an app that somehow everybody in the world is going to use or everybody in America is gonna use or everybody in Canada is gonna use. Well, they've tried to deploy apps in other countries for COVID contact tracing and they've gotten a very limited pickup, right? Not everybody's gonna download it. Not everybody's gonna know how to use it, even if it is built in to Apple or Google operating systems, uh, there's going to be a way to turn it off. So you, you're not necessarily getting reliable data. So we should just push back against this idea that it is possible to build technology to save us. And instead we should think about it as a human in the loop system, that this is uh, technology that we're going to have to use in conjunction with human contact tracers in order to collectively solve this crisis. I think it's so interesting uh, that we are in this time where facial recognition is within itself having a crisis because now we're all being mandated to wear masks. And if I can just draw your attention to the technical aspects of these uh, surveillance issues now, uh, you know, this was on CNEC very recently, we've all taken pictures of ourselves wearing our selfies, our, our, our masks. And now, as you said, Meredith, the same scientists are working under the same conditions at home, uh, scouring the net, specifically uh, Instagram, looking at our masked selfies. And over 2000 images uh, have already been used off of Instagram. And when asked about the ethics behind using these images for this data, the CEO of the company replied, if you don't want your image used, you should have a private Instagram page. So it's this kind of carte blanche that is written, uh, use our apps, enjoy our apps. They're gonna improve your life. We're watching you. Don't look over here while we're taking it all when you're not looking. Can you talk to us a little bit about those instances before we get into the nuts and bolts of what we can actually do? Well, Facebook and the, all of those apps are, use, are using our faces to train their data sets without our willful consent. And one thing that Joy and the Algorithmic Justice League talk about is that we need to have meaningful consent over the use of our images. And, and the tech companies shouldn't have carte blanche over our data, over our faces, to use our faces to train their data sets. And I'm glad you brought up the issue of ethics because uh, as Shalini said, the Algorithmic Justice League's work, Joy's work, uh, brings up the issue of ethics inside software. Uh, it is amazing to me that the conversation about tech ethics has only uh, really exploded in the past couple of years because this has been a kind of slow moving crisis throughout tech's entire history. Uh, most of the ideas that we think are common about technology actually come from uh, a very small and homogeneous group of people from Ivy League educated white men who were trained as mathematicians. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, some of my best friends are white male mathematicians. Uh, but the problem is that when you build, when we have a small group of people building technology, that technology gets all of the conscious and unconscious bias of that group of people, right? So it is not necessarily ethical technology. So what we need to start building now is we need to start uh, with an ethical framework. We need to make sure 
that the technology that we're building is ethical. And so facial recognition is a really good uh, case study for thinking through how have we built an ethical technology and how can we build more ethical technology in the future? And I think uh, to, to help people uh, who are perhaps new to this uh, debate about whether it's AI is benevolent or not, we have uh, another clip that was uh, presented not in the film, but uh, for those of us here today, I'd like to show it. And it's uh, the Google short clip where we can really understand how basic the premise is and how wrong the very basic footprint uh, that all of this is built on. Let's roll that Google short clip, please. Computer scientists know that computers cannot autonomously determine what is good. So what they decided was that they were going to use popular instead of good. This is a decision that you see in the algorithm that is at the heart of Google search. There are lots of things out there that are popular but not good, like racism or ramen burgers. And so the idea that we would use popularity as a proxy for good completely fails when we're trying to build computer systems that are making decisions for billions of people. It's such a salient point. I feel, you know, trying to discuss the difference between good and popular is the most basic argument you have as a parent with your toddler. Uh, and the fact that no one realizes that this argument has actually been lost at the most basic level of computer programming is, is stunning. Um, I wanna jump to an audience uh, question, which is an excellent one from Bruno Medina, who is an AI and deep learning researcher and wants to know, how can he and his uh, colleagues help people now with their current protests? I know in the film, Shalini, you, you dedicate time showing people in Hong Kong using laser pointers to uh, kind of make it difficult for the cameras to recognize our faces. What tactical, tangible issues or things can we do to protect ourselves? And what can AI do to protect us? We need laws. Um, we actually need laws. And I think that tech companies can do things like uh, get their companies to adopt the safe play face pledge. Uh, I have some on the Coded Bias website. We have a few actions that you can take with our partners, um, partners like the Algorithmic Justice League, Mehente, who has a, 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 pr a program that is about no tech for ICE. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do to start saying we need meaningful consent over our images and our data. We need laws that govern big tech companies first and foremost, because as much as it is on tech, they're not going to get us out of this. We actually need legislation that can be enforced to sort of roll back the power that they have in our society, um, which, is, which is really, um, sort of the biggest power <laughs> that the world has ever seen in a certain way. And, it, and to me, it is the biggest threat that faces our democracies in the 21st century. Absolutely. Meredith? You have to have a mute. All right, sorry about that. Uh, it's the inevitable moment. I, I would echo what Shalini said. I check out the Algorithmic Justice League, check out Coded Bias's website for suggestions, uh, give money to organizations who are uh, helping protesters, uh, give money to anti-racist organizations. Uh, and I would also say, let's not necessarily assume that we can build technology to get our way out of the pickle that we're in collectively as a society right now. Because over-reliance on technology is one of the things that got us here. So let's be thoughtful about when we can and should use technology. Because sometimes, you know, sometimes technology is wonderful. Sometimes we absolutely should be using computers. And then other times, 
you know, we should be using a pen and paper and one is not better than the other. Mm -hmm. It's about what is the right tool for the task. Tool for the task. I also want to hold up the work of the ACLU um, and fight for our future because they're they're starting to ban facial recognition in schools where they're, they're using it for things like attendance, the show of kids are even paying attention to get into buildings. We can start to ban that use. Um, facial recognition has been banned by government in San Francisco and in Oakland and in Somerville, Massachusetts in the States. So in other words, the, the cities in the US that are most tech savvy, that know what this technology has done, have been the first to ban the use of these technologies in their communities. And that should be a signal to the rest of us of how we should deploy these technologies. Um, I think that uh, Canadians are wondering uh, what is the state of our legislation? And what I would say is that again, like every state, every province has uh, different laws that govern how far police departments can go and also how far police budgets can go towards this type of weaponization of technology. And in a discussion that we had earlier this week with another documentary in Hot Docs, I Human, talking about the fact that this is the time where the most discussion for lawmakers and uh, for our, our elected officials to be happy, which should be happening now. And yet in the United States, the assembly has been canceled. This is when you were meant to vote this spring uh, about privacy laws. And we are having the same types of issues in Canada. So we have to keep our foot on the gas as citizens, if I can paraphrase what you're saying. Um, I also would like to ask each of you to talk a little bit about how you behave, how you felt about technology before this film began and now afterwards. Obviously, Meredith, as a data journalist, you are uh, privy to this. You've known the, how horrible it is for a long time. <laughs> uh, but what do you do necessarily that other people could maybe follow suit with to protect yourself more? Well, I, I love technology. This is actually the first line of my book. I love technology and I build technology. I actually build AI tools for the purposes of investigative reporting. Uh, and I would say that people can uh, get involved in algorithmic accountability journalism. This is a relatively new kind of reporting uh, and it's a kind of journalism in which we hold algorithms accountable. As I said before, algorithms are increasingly being used to make decisions on our behalf, and we need to investigate those algorithms to hold them accountable in the way that Joy so beautifully does in the film. Uh, to say, hey, these algorithms are not all that they're being, uh, that they're being marketed as. Some of these things work really badly. So if we go to uh, school surveillance technology, as Shalini just mentioned, there are a lot of uh, exam proctoring apps out there right now that claim that while well, students are doing remote learning and so they need their exams proctored, so there's this surveillance technology that will uh, watch the student or will lock the student out of all of the other programs on their computer. But these things work very badly. So one student found that when she uh, kind of leaned down to get a tissue and then blow her nose uh, during the exam, the software flagged her as cheating because it thought that the tissue that was on her nose was a piece of paper that she was using to cheat. You know, And obviously having a runny nose is not cheating. It's just having a runny nose. It's an inevitable fact of life. Uh, so we can be critical of these technologies. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about algorithmic accountability reporting, uh, I recommend reading ProPublica, a uh, terrific investigative journalism outfit uh, that under Julia Angwin was responsible for the machine bias investigation uh, that is mentioned in the film. Uh, Julia has since left ProPublica and founded a new investigative uh, outlet called The Markup, which is doing a lot of work about algorithmic accountability reporting and saying what exactly is going on with these algorithms and let's call bullshit when bullshit is needed. 
or when we need to call bullshit. Yeah, I'm still thinking about your last question. I just want to follow up and say in this moment, one thing that we can push for is that face in solidarity with the movement that is happening outside my window is that we can push for a universal ban of facial recognition by law enforcement. We know that this technology does not work as well as discriminatory against people of color. And until we uh, have laws that govern it, until we, know, we uh, have tested it and know it works the same for everyone and that we have some laws, I think we should just universally press pause on the use of this technology by all law enforcement, including ICE. Um, so that's one thing. And then I, I came at this at a very different place. Like I, there are seven PhDs in my film. I call myself more of like a barstool scientist. <laughs> I actually couldn't talk to people for a long time because they would ask me what I'm doing. And I'd be like, well, making this film about how machines could be racist and sexist. And I would just watch their eyes glaze over. And so um, I think that what I've learned a lot about is to question everything. That, you know, we live in a world where if you say something and a computer says something, you're wrong. <laughs> the computer says it, it's right. And so we have to live in a society now where we start to question technological systems in a real structural way. And that means that, you know, law, we have to have laws, but that we also start to question um, the very systems we interact with every day. The other thing that I didn't realize was the pervasiveness of these systems. How automated systems that we don't fully understand, that we have not vetted, that we don't know if are accurate, are being used for things like deciding who gets healthcare or not. A, a well, a, a, a healthcare algorithm that was widely used was shown to provide white people with better health care than black patients, right? And so you can see how dangerous this is. They're using it um, in prison sentencing. We know that from Julia Angwin's um, groundbreaking work, right? Where we've seen that algorithms have um, predicted, they're now saying this is your danger of recommitting a crime, like a minority report Steven Spielberg film, and saying this is your danger of committing a crime. And it shows more times that black people are more likely to commit a crime than white people. And because we've gone back, they've gone back and looked at the research, they said this was not true, <laughs> right? So these algorithms are making predictions about us all the time. And I did not understand the pervasiveness about it. And so I think like we live in this world and we're like, so what, our Facebook, I wanted to see a pair of shoes that knows I like those kinds of shoes, you know? Mm -hmm. But what we don't think about, what I didn't realize, what I learned in the making of this film is the completeness of that data, of, of these data predictions, how much they can garner about you. Mm -hmm. um, that they can, you know, predict whether you will, um, your likelihood to, um, to, to fall under manic depression in the next six months. Uh, your likelihood to be, become pregnant in the next three months. Like machines are making predictions about this and it's dangerous because it's kind of right. And it, yet it can have these false negatives that have real implications for people. And already we are trusting this with sacred things, figuring out who gets housing, who gets healthcare, who gets hired. And these are already the invisible gatekeepers. When you apply to college, it might be, you know, an algorithmic sorter that actually gets you through that first phase. And so um, we have to be really careful about these, what we are outsourcing these automated decision makers to do for us. I feel like so many Canadians who are watching and participating in this discussion are saying, oh, but you know, I'm in Canada. So those things, those college admissions, they're very different here in university. And I just wanna call attention. Uh, and this also feeds into that argument that people often make that, okay, we can't stop using facial recognition just because it's not perfect, because isn't it worth it for the threat of things like terrorism, uh, for someone to be stopped and frisked versus uh, not stopping that person and having that person commit 
some horrible crime. That is the, the thought process of those who still cannot uh, penetrate the ethics of what is happening. And I'm gonna share another article. And this is, this is from two years ago. This is not new. Uh, this cuts across all issues of uh, skin tone. There is AI from two years ago that is guessing with clarity whether you are heterosexual or homosexual. This is the exact technology that was being used by the same scientists that inspired the work of Cambridge Analytica. And two years ago when that story broke, uh, it became a political issue about the election tampering we are talking about a technology that overrides all timely discussions. In the impunity that we mentioned at the onset of this discussion, technology, those who own the machines are deciding what that machine is going to do. I think it's very difficult as citizens to feel that there is something to be done. And that's why your film, Shalini, is so important because it holds a mirror. And when I say a mirror, specifically your filmmaking style you allow the cameras to show those activists the fruit of their work. You so meaningfully keep the cameras on the residents of the Atlantic housing uh, development to see when Joy goes to Congress and has her congressional moment. And she's advocating for all the work that she collected from this group uh, be heard and be actioned upon by the most unlikely heroes in that moment in Congress. And that to me is so significant because there is that feeling of absolute David Goliath helplessness as a private citizen who doesn't understand AI, who doesn't have a legislative team, a legal team behind us to launch civil uh, lawsuits and class action lawsuits. If you can show a person taking this fight on and winning, how galvanizing that can be. So I thank you so much, Shalini. Uh, for keeping that footage in the film. Meredith, I'm wondering if you, uh, a lot of our audience members are asking, can you tell us more about what Joy's doing with the algorithmic Justice League? Can you, can you tell us uh, what's happening there? Uh, so the Algorithmic Justice League uh, is an organization that Joy started uh, and they have something called the Safe Face Pledge uh, which, Shalene, maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about it. Um, it's a pledge to use facial recognition responsibly or not at all. Shalene? <laughs> you said it, and, and people can sign up, and it's a way of sort of making this first step. But going back to what you're saying um, about the predatory nature of this, is that we've come to accept these like giant monopolies who have collected our data because we believe that this is the only way the business model can work, right? And so we sort of are getting used. Oh, of course, when we sign into Facebook or even when we don't sign into Facebook, uh, that they have more information. They make the Stasi look like they had a light touch is the model <laughs> of it that Facebook garners about the intimate details of our lives, right? And we know that, you know, um, they did a study, for instance, that was published in, in a magazine called Nature, where they did experimented on a small group of people, right? It was, it was a few million. And by showing, I voted with little tiny, with little tiny thumbnails of your friends, it turned out an excess of 100,000 people to the polls, right? So, so Facebook with a very light touch sort of could swing an election without us knowing it, right? Like that's how powerful this technology is. We've just come, we've like so much, there is a broken social contract between tech and citizens that needs to be repaired here. And so, um, we have come to believe that, okay, if we sign on, we're getting the service for free. And that is because we are what is being sold. Our attention is sort of what is for sale to everyone. And until we change that business model, we are not gonna have, um, I feel that these tech companies are a threat to democratic institutions. And so, um, 
Yes. So those that's just that's that's a perfect point to jump in with uh, another audience member who wanted to know more information about the young skateboarder in China who you follow, who seems to espouse a very different attitude that she is welcoming uh, the fact that AI is going to help her save time in her life by not wasting it on people who she should not waste her time on as being un unsuitable friends. Uh, so, you know, you're talking about changing the contract between a consumer and big tech. And now this is a completely different political system where the citizen has a very different relationship from the get go and very few means to uh, act out, uh, opt out of that relationship. Tell us more about her. Well, yes, I mean, I think that that little section of the film is meant to be sort of a black mirror episode inside of a documentary. And it aims to show a reflection of ourselves that when we're half asleep and walking through life and we're like, this is very efficient, look how convenient this is, without thinking of how it's eroding civil rights, without thinking of its greater implications, that that's where we're headed. And so in China, it's a very different model. We see um, a situation where government has unfettered access to your information. It knows, it, it, it can even monitor your location to figure out whether you've broken quarantine or not. Some might say, well, that's a wonderful thing, but is that a world that we actually wanna live in as a democratic society? Here, it's happening in the States in this hyper-commercialized way. We don't yet have a sense of AI, what AI would look like in the common good. What would AI look like with a different business model? And you know what the smart women in my film, that's the thing that you were getting me to, is like, what, what were you doing in the film that made you learn? Uh, is that the women in my film have taught me, and they're mostly women, but the experts, data scientists, mathematicians in my film have taught me is that there is there are other ways to do business. It's just up to us to say, we have to change the fundamental business model of big tech. And we have to have, some sort of civil rights around our data. And unfortunately, we're coming to the, the last uh, minute of our discussion. And Meredith, I'm wondering if uh, you can offer any salvo, any, any way for us to feel better about the huge footprint of AI in our lives. Uh, moving forward, is there anything that we can feel good about? <laughs> <laughs> well, the one thing that you can do to uh, to kind of have a have a big leap forward in understanding these issues is watch Helene's film. I uh, I would also uh, leave everybody with a reading list. So I'm a professor, so of course I have a syllabus for you, right? Uh, we got the time. We got the time to be reading, people. All right, pencils yeah. out. Okay, so you're going to want to start with Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Noble, who is in the film. Uh, Race After Technology by Ruha Benjamin, Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks, who's in the film, uh, Black Software by Charlton McElwain, uh, and uh, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my own book. I was going to do it for you, don't feel thank badly. You, thank <laughs> you, Artificial Unintelligence. Uh, and of course, Kathy O'Neill's very important book, Weapons of Math Destruction. Uh, so you can read, you can watch, uh, you can get educated about these issues. Computational literacy is really important so that you don't feel like you have to just sit back and let things happen to you. You have a voice in this as a citizen of your country, of your town, of your city, you have a say. You just need to understand a little bit about the computational systems in order to start speaking up about injustice. Uh, and before I turn it over to you, Shalini, for a final word to our audiences, I'd like to point out uh, that it is women and it is primarily women of color that your film shows fighting this fight uh, I will say that after having seen the film, I went and took a look at the big five banks in, in Canada to see what kind of AI ethics uh, 
are they practicing? What do they share? And I was pleased that at least one of them actually quotes directly from Joy's work extensively. Uh, so that made me feel better. But it, it was very, uh, very clear that it is the voices of the oppressed that are leading this change. And I wanna thank you for highlighting who you did. Can you just give us what your opinion? Are we doomed? What's gonna happen, Shalini? Look in the, look in the future. Um, I'm hopeful because uh, just like I said, 10 minutes before I saw this, I saw people of all colors changing the world outside my window, but they couldn't do it. They, they, it took people working together. And this is the moment. This is the pivotal moment for our democracy. The battles for civil rights are going to happen here in algorithms, in tech, in AI. And so it's up to us to be educated. It's us to it's up to us to be civically engaged. If you feel like you can't make a difference, I would encourage you to act locally. Get your local government to ban facial recognition. If you and 50 of your friends do it, you have a movement. And so this moment is a pivotal moment. We see what's happening in Hong Kong. You see what's happening on the streets of Minneapolis and Brooklyn and cities all around the world. It's up to all of us to stand up and say, this is the future we want to build together. And I really actually believe that we're in a moment of civic engagement and that can kind of spark the kind of change that can lead us to a different future. But it's not one that's going to show up written. We all have to write it together. Thank you, Shalini. Those are inspiring words. Thank you, Meredith, uh, for your work and your continued diligence. And thank you, Shalini, for giving us uh, an, you know, a feature length uh, time frame to really change our scope on the world ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you both for the film. <laughs> Absolutely, both for the audience awards and thank you so much uh, to our guests for this fascinating timely discussion. Meredith, we're gonna tweet out your reading list on the Hot Docs Twitter account. Um, join us for our next Big Ideas conversation. It's this Saturday, June 6th at 3 p.m. as we discuss the World Economic Forum as seen in the film, The Forum and the role world leaders, corporations and individuals play in ensuring the health of our planet, particularly at this challenging moment in human history. Thank you again to our guests. Thank you, our audience, for being here, and goodbye for now.